Hello, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to uh, Trinity College Dublin's celebration of International Women's Day 2023. Today um, is March 8th. It is a globally uh, recognised day, um, and it also marks um, a, a call into action to accelerate women's equality and to celebrate the achievements of women globally. The theme this year is about embracing equity in recognition that equal isn't always fair because people start from different places. So true inclusion and belonging require equitable actions. And breaking bias in sport really continues to be a very challenging area, but significant strides have been made towards equitable access to sporting careers and, and that have been achieved in, in recent years. Um, so today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Fiona Wilson from the School of Medicine to talk to us. She's the Head of Discipline for Physiotherapy, has, has over 30 years of experience in clinical physio, teaching and research. And her research interests include athlete back pain and brain health and wellness, with a particular focus on the female athlete experience from adolescence right throughout life. Today, Prof Wilson is going to talk to us about menopause, exercise and sport. And if anyone has any questions, please, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll have a discussion then at the end. Thank you so much, Fiona. Over to you. Thanks, Cherie. So I will share my screen. Um, you can tell me when you can see it. You see that? Okay. Just going to pop this down. Okay, you can hear me. All good. Yeah. Okay. Going. So, um, thanks very much. It's, I'm delighted to be here to give this talk. Um, I'm going to take you through a few different aspects of this, all based around the menopause. So, just a bit of an introduction. Thanks, Cherie. You gave some of the introduction. So, I'm not a gynecologist, and I'm not an endocrinologist. I'm not a physician. So, I obviously don't specialize in hormones or or women's health in particular, but I am a physio. Um, I'm an associate professor here in the School of Medicine, and I specialize in, in, in exercise. So <clears throat> I've had over 30 years as a clinical physiotherapist, and I'm also a researcher, and I've worked in high performance sports around the world. So I was head physio for the Irish rowing team for years, and I've worked in elite um, rugby and, and football and a couple of other sports as well. And I specialize in exercise prescription. That's my passion. I'm a member of the World Rowing Sports Medicine Commission, and I, I've focused on women's experience throughout my career. I'm a rower. Um, I was a rower when I was younger, and I came back to it in, in recent years, and I'm, a, I'm quite a bad runner, but I, I keep trying. So there's a lesson for everybody. So what is menopause? I'm just going to see if I can pop this bit down. Um, so this is the World Health Organization. So it's a point in the continuum of life stages for women in the reproduction years. And after menopause, a woman can't become um, pregnant. And it's basically when we stop ovulating. And for most women, it's between 45 and 55, and it's a natural part of aging. Um, it's, it's a gradual transition and what we call the perimenopause that starts it um, usually around mid forties and it, and it goes on for a number of years. And there's numerous symptoms that are associated with it. Started off with a very small number of symptoms and as women have become more vocal and the conversation has moved and the stigma has been removed eventually, we see that there's actually quite a breadth of symptoms. So that's physical, emotional, mental and social well-being. And there's interventions, so non-hormonal and hormonal. So I'm particularly interested in exercise and part of that, how it how it interacts with um, hormonal interventions. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And it can also be a consequence of surgical and medical procedures. So one of the things we often we see with athletes sometimes um, is early menopause, where they maybe have had long periods of not menstruating, no periods throughout their career for various different reasons. So we can't presume that it's just something that happens to women between 45 and 55 years. There can be variation in that. So what are the signs and symptoms? The main one is change in regularity and flow of uh, menstruation and then eventually the end of menstruation. And that can vary hugely for people. So for some people, it can stop quite quickly. For some people that can go on for a couple of years. It can become, it can get to a stage where they have more frequent periods or they have very heavy periods or periods become more light. So really it's a change that happens. Probably the symptoms that are most well-recognized or can be the most debilitating for many women 
of what we call vasomotor symptoms, which are hot flushes and night sweating. Um, so these are often well documented that in recent years, we've seen women who are quite well known in the media talking about hot flushes and um, the, the difficulties that this brings, particularly things like working careers. Change sleep patterns can be an, an, another one where women are waking up in the early hours of the morning or they can't get back to or they can't get to sleep. Mood changes. So I think we're all well aware of the hormonally induced mood changes. One that wasn't so well documented, but is becoming more and more documented are things like musculoskeletal pain and injury. This is one I see a lot as a physiotherapist. So joint pains, particularly we see it in, in tendons. So change in um, tendon structure uh, and the, um, because estrogen affects them so much. And then things like vaginal atrophy and dryness, again, stigma. People don't talk about this and they're starting to talk about that now, which is good. And brain fog. Again, this is one that's been talked about more recently. And this can be very debilitating when people are, are working, obviously. So that list of signs and symptoms is not limited. They are growing and growing as actually we're getting people to be interested enough to, to explore this. So why should we pay attention? I think I'm probably talking to an audience who agrees with this anyway, but the reason why we should pay attention is because women constitute half the population. And from the WHO, we know that in 2021, women over 50 will be, will account, in accounted for a, a quarter of the population of women and girls globally. So that's a lot of women who are going through this. So really important. So. Let's get down to basics. How did the world see women at midlife? So this is what I grew up with. This is how women in middle age was seen. Bit of a joke. Um, this is actually, if you Google women in menopause, these two come up and laughing about it and seen as kind of um, not attractive, kind of funny, um, overweight, frumpy, those, those words that are used. Um, in the 70s, 80s, when I grew up, there were two types of women. And the Carry On film is a classic one where there's the Dolly Bird, the, the attractive younger woman. And then they get to a certain period and they are no longer attractive. A bit of a joke, something to be laughed at. And this is what it was. And so much so they had men dressed up as women um, joking about menopause. So not a good place, not well represented in the media. And how? what about men in midlife so this is really how men in midlife I know this is a modern representation but this is how men in midlife are seen so um hopefully nobody's fluttering into their coffee here but that's Tom Cruise um who, who is in his 50s obviously looking after himself in great shape but represented and seen very differently to how women can be seen in the media and then we've got Hugh Jackman on the right but this is not these are not just individual cases this has been going for a long time if you think about Someone like James Bond, you know, getting older and older and still seen as um, having lots of life in them and being physically fit um, and let's let's be honest, attractive. But is this changing? Well, hopefully it is. Um, really interesting observation recently that the latest Sex in the City movie, the and just like that, so Jessica Parker et al are exactly the same age as the women in the Golden Girls. So the Golden Girls were seen as old women and the stories about old women at the end of their life, really end of their careers. And it was, you know, entertaining. And these are great women, but they're the same age as the women on the right who are still seen as being sexual beings, um, working, having good careers, being attractive, exercising, etc. So hopefully things are changing. There's definitely a push and women are given a bigger voice and they can talk about this. And with that has come a co an honest conversation about menopause and how this affects women who still want to live a very full life. And this is my tribe. So these are the women I row with. So I think all but one of these women are perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause. And we are here training for a big competition in a couple of weeks where we will um, thrash up and down the River Thames for 20 minutes flat out and hopefully don't die and are able to get out of the boat without 
some sort of help at the end of it. So, and this is normal now. Women are expected or allowed to compete if they want to, allowed to exercise, allowed to be out there doing what younger women do. And it's, that's seen as acceptable. And I think even in our mother's era or my mother's era, that wasn't simply wasn't something they did. It was slightly different. They were doing things. Um, I remember my grandmother in her 50s would get up at five in the morning and go and milk cows and shout at cows and carry big buckets back of milk. Um, but that was slightly different. That was work. But to be able to enjoy exercising and compete and that kind of thing was different. So why is exercise important in menopause transition and beyond? We're going to talk a little bit about that. So this is a photo of a 72 year old. I know it's an extreme example, but let's just say that the examples out there and, and women can dare to hope and, and dare to be well and fit and the better, living their best life in menopause and beyond. So what happens? So the biggest thing is we, we lose estrogen and that's, that happens quite rapidly as you get into the menopause. We also lose testosterone. That decline is a little bit slower over three to five years. So it's the estrogen loss that, that causes the main symptoms that we experience. So estrogen is an anti-inflammatory. Those sex hormones are important because they help uh, deal with inflammation in the body. And one of the things estrogen does is protect the cardiovascular system. So it keeps our cardiovascular system well. So one of the biggest causes of um, illness or, or sickness in older women is cardiovascular disease. So that's important to remember. So that's one of the reasons is we, we lose estrogen. And one of the things we see is a decline in muscle mass. So we all lose muscle as we get older. That, that's normal, but actually losing estrogen sees that happen more rapidly. So during the menopausal transition, our fat mass, the amount of fat we have in our body increases by 2% per year. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but if you think of that over five years, that's a 10% increase in the amount of fat that we are carrying. And then over 10 years, obviously that's more. Um, and our lean body mass, which is our muscle, decreases by 0.5% per year. So again, that's quite a lot when you take it over a couple of years at that 50, 45 to 55 transition. And, and if you look at perimenopause to menopausal women, we do see that change in the shape of women. And a lot of it is to do with that. And it's that loss of estrogen. And the question is, what can we do about that? Because we don't really want our fat mass to increase. That that's not a healthy situation. So can we um, work a little bit against that and mitigate the health risks that, that carries with us? One of the important things about having increased muscle mass, so having as much muscle as we can carry um, or as our skeleton will hold, is it keeps our metabolic rate up. So it it stops us from gaining fat actually. So our metabolism stays up. The higher the muscle, the higher your metabolism. And it also protects us from something that's called frailty. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And an area that's been quite well researched, which is really good, and probably because it became such a big public health problem, was declining bone mineral density. So our bones become more fragile as we get older because we lose estrogen. There has been some good research done on that, and there has been a lot of interventions done on that because osteoporosis is associated with fractures, which has been is linked with mortality is early risk of dying in women so there has been a lot of interventions in that but I think some of the work on the muscle is behind that and there's lots we can do there to help that so this word sar sarcopenia you might hear of that and this is something I'm very interested in because it, it's an area I work in in, in uh, as a physio and we can influence that is that declining muscle mass. So estrogen is really important for muscle strength. So we lose estrogen and get a reduction in your muscle strength, low muscle quality and quantity. So you get less muscle and it doesn't work as well. And what is quite interesting, if you look at pictures of women doing exercises over a certain age, what we see are these piddly little weights 
So that woman has pink, pink weights to start with, and they're really light. Now, that's just a photograph, and we don't know what is wrong with that woman, but I couldn't see that those weights would do anything. And this is a classic thing that happens in women of a certain age doing resistance exercise. They underdose. They don't do a high enough resistance um, in their exercises. And part of that is because people are frightened of prescribing a higher resistance because we kind of treat women over a certain age as not capable of doing much. Um, and then also because there's a lack of guidelines in really what we can do. So dosage is really important in, in exercise, um, particularly in resistance exercise. So if you're doing resistance exercise, it's high enough to have an effect and help you maintain your muscle mass. We don't know how much muscle mass you can gain, some research says it's, it's very difficult as you get older, but certainly you can do a lot to maintain what you have already. And that is really, really important. And then bone health, as I said, that's been done really well because osteoporosis and associated fractures is a big public health problem. So weight bearing exercise is really important and resistance exercise is part of that. So to help prevent bone decline, it is, comes with that rapid loss of estrogen. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing with um, Boston Children's Hospital, the female athlete program. There's a group of researchers there. And I think Rory Kelly, who is one of the researchers who um, has been working on this program, might have tuned in here. Hopefully she has. And um, we're presenting it last week in Stanford at the meeting. So we did a, a project looking at menopause and athletes. So looking at how that affects relatively elite athletes so athletes who are hoping to compete and still train very regularly so the team that's working there so Dr Kate Ackerman leads that research team and the female athlete program where they have some amazing work going on so so Kate is um former international rower and part of the world rowing sports medicine commission with me so we know each other Rory Kelly who I think has tuned in here who's been doing a lot of the heavy lifting on this project, Sean McAuliffe, who um, is one of my uh, colleagues here in Trinity. So what this question often comes up, what can researching elite athletes tell us about general people? Surely they're slightly different to everybody else. Well, when we look at elite athletes, because they don't have what we called comorbidities, they're generally very, very healthy and they don't have other illnesses and diseases going on with them, then it helps us research that one disorder or disease in a, in a kind of pure, purer fashion. So it can be very useful for translating that knowledge to other populations. So we did what's called a scoping review where we looked at all the research that was out there and we looked at nearly 1600 studies that were doing research in this area to see what athletes experiences were. And in the end, we got 22 studies that um, included what we wanted to look at. And we put the data information into groups. We found that these studies kind of fell into groups. Rory did a lot of work on that. Thank you, Rory. So with the, the kind of women who are in this, these studies between 40 and 66, going through the menopausal transition or post-menopause, and there were women who were local level, level representation in sports, uh, three times a week and identified with a specific sport. Some of them were on HRT and some not, which gave us some useful comparisons. And the sports they were doing were runners, cyclists, swimmers, and weightlifters. So where did the research fall into? So quite a lot in bone, which were good, quite a lot in endocrine and metabolism. So these are hormones and the effect on our metabolism. Some in the cardiovascular system, some on training, how menopause affects their training, and then some on nutrition and calcium in intake. So um, this is a, a woman in her 60s who's an athlete. Um, so bone quite well done so being an athlete helps prevent bone density so we, we know that they're doing training they're doing their weight bearing exercise some studies suggested that maybe being an elite athlete didn't give you particular benefit above being a, a general exerciser so probably need to be, do more research on that what was positive being on hrt seems to help prevent um, preserve your bone density but we don't know if being an athlete and being on HRT gave you extra benefits, but certainly it was positive anyway. This one was really interesting. So this is about hormones. So what we see in general people that we think we see, 
um, is that even in elite athletes, menopause is associated with an increase in fat mass and body fat percentage. So this happens to these elite athletes training a lot. However, those who are on HRT, when compared to athletes who weren't on HRT, they had lower fat mass. So the HRT seems to protect you from putting on the fat mass that's associated with normal um, with normal menopausal transition. Athletes generally had lower body fat percentage than the general population. What was quite interesting is in runners have higher insulin sensitivity. So this really is about um, how their body processes carbohydrate that we know if this stops working and it generally slows down a bit as you get older, it's associated with getting type two diabetes. So they being an athlete seemed to help maintain that as if when they were younger. And again, HRT seemed to help that more. You get spikes in estrogen when you train. So certainly we know after you do resistance exercise, it goes up. And we we one of the studies looked at distance runners and their estrogen came up after they did a race. So um, training seems to boost your estrogen. Um, cardiovascular was interesting that we know VO2 max, which is a measure of how you use oxygen. And we, we test athletes with this. It, go, it declines as you get. Um, older, but menopause didn't seem to interrupt it. It was just this normal HRT, um, some normal age-related decline. However, HRT seemed to protect it from declining so quickly. Athletes had a higher VO2 max than non-athletes. Well, that's not really a surprising. But endurance training seems to protect the heart. We saw some structural things that um, that the training that these women were doing seemed to protect the heart from normal what we see in normal aging in hearts. Training, now this is a really interesting one um, that generally there's not good information on how elite athletes should train as they get older. And this is for all masters athletes. I've, I've been really interested in and just trying to find out about this, things like recovery, why is that slower as you get older? And there's just generally not good information. I think it's because the world expects people not to be doing exercise at this level as they get older. So there's a big gap in knowledge there. Certainly my own experience is that it's just harder to recover in general and maybe a higher risk of getting injured. Nutrition, generally quite well done. It, it focused on calcium in, intake, which was quite good in athletes. Um, we don't know if they should be con consuming more, but they seem to consume the same amount as general, um, the general public. And we're not sure what the dosage is. So there probably needs to be a little bit more research done in this because certainly we need uh, this links with osteoporosis and protecting the skeleton. So some take home messages is that exercising regularly at moderate to high intensity is beneficial through the menopause uh, transition in these athletes. It protects bone health for sure. It's associated with lower fat mass so that we know that fat, your body fat going up is normal in, in menopause, but exercising at this level seems to keep that down and protect you. It helps you retain muscle mass, which is really important. It's good for the cardiovascular system, insulin sensitivity, and your lipid profile. So this is keeping good cardiovascular health. Adding in HRT seems to help everything, which is a bit of a good take home message for those on HRT or those who are interested in it. So just to give you a little bit of information on my own story, because I think it's always useful to get a lived experience on this. Um, one of the writers with Daily Telegraph, she's actually the rugby um, correspondent and she's Irish. And we've uh, been in contact quite a, a lot because she writes stories on rugby and I do research in rugby. We'd had chats about menopause and how women weren't represented as athletes. They have a female sports editor in the Daily Telegraph. It wouldn't be a newspaper of my choice, but we champion it because they have a female editor and they try and make sure women are represented. So they decided to do a, an article on women who are quite serious about sports and their experience with menopause transition. And, and that you should that's quite open access now, that article, if anybody's interested in reading it. And that's for me, it was about reducing the stigma. I've got to get out there and talk about it a little bit. Um, I think sometimes we don't because we just want to be seen as our younger selves. So that was a, a pretty interesting article and, and it got me talking about my own experiences because I think that can be useful. So for me, I've always been active and exercising, but I had a frozen shoulder in my mid-40s and 
that was clearly the onset of me starting to lose estrogen. It's a very common problem in, in women in their mid forties. And there's very little research done on why it happens to women in particular, but we're starting to see now it's because your estrogen starts dropping. I'd also had various tendon niggles and joint pains. And again, it just wasn't recognized that this is because of changing hormonal profiles, but that's exactly why I was having that little niggly injuries that I couldn't explain, joint pains, uh, painful menstruation. I was going out running and having to walk home because I was just in such pain. Palpitations was an interesting one for me. Um, I remember sitting in a conference with my heart going like the clappers thinking, oh, at least this is a medical conference. I can see cardiologists over there. I'll save my life when I have an event. Um, but it, I, I didn't, I hadn't, even I wasn't open to why I was having these symptoms. And then my recovery from my training was delayed. I was just thinking these are just normal aging. And actually they weren't, they were the onset of hormonal changes that were associated with perimenopause for me. And this is what I see in my patients, that women come in in their mid forties, going into their fifties, frozen shoulders, tendinopathy in their hip in particular, and in their shoulders, elbow, tennis elbow. And this is associated with tendon changes that they're, the estrogen changes that are going on. So in terms of managing for me, my GP is really good. She's a woman and I've got a really brilliant gynecologist, no messing, put me on HRT and all my symptoms went. And then moving the dosage around over the, the last couple of years as needed. Um, one of the other things I did was up my resistance training, make sure I was doing that, pretty committed to that. I got back into rowing. Actually, I hadn't been rowing for a good few years because I stopped with a back injury in my late 20s. So I got back into doing that with my tribe here, women who are all the same, actually, who I pulled them all back in. Some of them I'd been physio for the national team and some of them I'd rowed with when we were younger. So I got them all rowing again. And we talk about um, menopause all the time and perimenopause is one of our coffee talks. Um, and I would say deal with your symptoms as soon as you get them and don't wait for them to become debilitating. I think a lot of women wait until they get hot flushes until they think it's worth going to get some help. So if you're getting tendon pains, joint pains, any of those other symptoms, don't presume it's just because you're getting older. So prioritize your health. Women are rubbish at doing that. They, they look after everybody else, but they don't look after themselves. So go and see someone who will advise you properly and support you. If HRT is right for you, do that. But there's lots of other things you can do as well. And then some clinical pearls. So um, I could only find one in my uniform with a mask on. So muscle mass loss is a problem for women for midlife onwards. You see that body, those body changes. Women don't prioritize fitness and they often underdose on their training. So walking is great, but it won't build muscle. So you need specific exercise to do to really mitigate the effects of your losing estrogen and try and protect your bone health, protect your body composition, your cardiovascular health. So think about changing up your exercise programs. Um, so joint symptoms could be hormonally driven. So you're getting those aches and pains going into your 40s and 50s. They could be driven by hormones. And if your doctor doesn't listen to you, find another one. Don't be, don't be written off. Um, very regular weight bearing exercise with lots of resistance training is good. And you don't need weights in your house. So I do, I do squats and lunges and press ups. All of those are body weights and that's, that's good. If you can get access to doing weights, that's even better, but all of those are really helpful. It's one of the best investments in yourself that you can do. Um, so to wrap up, if you want to listen to good podcasts, this is Kate Ackerman, who um, is doing this menopause um, research with us. She is an endocrinologist. This is a great TED talk that's just been released. You should easily be able to find that. And then I'll leave you with the goddess who is JLo, who's showing that women can do it in their 50s. Um, now, I know that's an extreme example, but thank God for JLo. Let's keep it going. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Fiona. That was an absolutely incredible talk. Um, and I suppose for me, it, it's fascinating that we have this really um, abundant body of evidence now. Um, and can you maybe give us a bit of insight into how we can translate that evidence that you and your team have generated towards changing practice for Irish women, like in terms of like women who go to their GPs and are they are, are we getting the recommendations from our GPs um, 
to, to do weight bearing exercise and, and, and to carry out these things? And, and should our gyms be more focused and our PT sessions be more focused towards women at, at, at their certain age and, and their needs in terms of their bone density and resistance training? Yeah, I, th I think there is a building body of evidence, but it's not getting translated quick enough. So I think the bone health one did because it's such a public health problem. But I think there's still a lack of understanding about exactly what is needed in terms of resistance exercise. So we know it, evidence takes a long time to translate into practice. So I'm, I'm obviously going to wave the flag for physios, but we're pretty good at this. Um, so I think women have to drive it on themselves a little bit and seek out resistance exercise because I'm not sure that all the medical profession are still latched onto that. It is quite specific. Um, there's a lot of really good personal trainers in gym who can work with you on that. But there's also programs you can do in gyms. So things like body pump, if anybody's ever heard of that, a lot of good gyms do that. So that's a brilliant exercise program that takes you through resistance exercise. Um, reformer pilates in particular that i recommend to people yoga is body weight but you're still pushing against your own resistance particularly things like yoga flow so seeking out those programs if you're in a good gym then talking to the instructor saying look i need to do resistance exercise i need to load a little bit higher than i think i've been loading what would you recommend and drive it on yourself i think if you can and then things like rowing taking up rowing. I mean, I'm obviously going to sing, sing the praise for rowing, but maybe getting back into the sport that you used to do, there's a big drive to do that now. Thank you, Fiona. You've actually answered beautifully the first question there, which was a, a, asking for a recommendation for people in their late 50s who up to now have only been walking and running. Uh, but thank you for, 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 for um, answering that so beautifully. Um, any advice for women in the workplace with menopause regarding setting up a health initiative and work? Any ideas? Um, so I think... From my point of view, a health initiative would try and be, get engaged with some exercise program that includes resistance exercise. So whether that's to get someone to come into the workplace to do a program once a week or something like that, or link in your workplace with some gym that does a resistance exercise program. And like I said, body pump is one that I really like. Um, Pilates, reformer Pilates is another one. You're pushing against resistance. I think tap in to an exercise professional, whether it's a physio or a strength conditioning expert who will actually provide that. I think most women are really good at things like walking and that's okay for your cardiovascular, but I think it's the resistance that you need to tap into. Thank you. Um, there's another question in here, is HRD the only answer? What are some of the drawbacks of taking it? So I'm not an endocrinologist and I'm not a gynecologist. It really worked for me. So I think it's, it's, it can't be the only answer. Certainly, um, we know that by exercising, you boost your estrogen. And I think if you're interested in HRT, talk to your doctor about what your options are. It did really work for me and I've seen it really work for my patients, but it needs to be prescribed on an individual basis. But think about all the other stuff that goes around that. And that is the big other piece of that is exercise and, and committing to exercise. Thank you. And actually, just on a follow up from that, some of your evidence is very clear that the HRD seems to be um, pr protecting your female athletes against you know, the, the accelerated loss in, in, in the muscle mass and the, and the gain of fat. Um, do you have any evidence to suggest that the earlier those athletes start HRT, the more protective it is, or, or does it matter when you start it? So I think I think I might have read one paper that the and, and it wasn't actually on athletes. It was actually a general state of where we are on um, menopause that the earlier you get in and managing the symptoms of the HRT, if that's right for you, the better the effect is because it, it protects it kind of tops up your estrogen back to where it was and it stops up that, that uh, bone mass muscle mass. Um, but I think. When in athletes, there's very few studies done. And really the ones we had were comparing groups of athletes, some who were on it and some who weren't. And it definitely seemed to be very protective. Okay, thank you. Um, question here from Anya Kelly. Great presentation, Fiona. Do you think we need sex specific physical activity guidelines for different age populations? Is there evidence that different exercise modalities and doses are better for women or, or men, especially at midlife and later? Yeah, absolutely. And I think our physical activity guidelines are very general. They're not very good. I like who count who thinks of 150 minutes. I don't even know how many hours that is. Um, so they're they're just not group specific. I think maybe for kids it's specific, but for women, they're very different to men. Women between 40 and 60 are very different to what men are going through. 
Um, so I think we need specific targeted interventions and we have to drive that on. And it's, it has to be individually tailored. I think with the caveat that it's going to happen at different phases for different people. So that's going to be really important. OK, and a follow on question here from Christina Lysa. Um, thank you for the very interesting talk, Fiona. How long would you recommend exercising for and how often? You know, it, it was the guidelines, the 150 minutes is a bit um, too generic. Uh, and would all types of exercise be OK or would you recommend lifting weights in particular? So so I think as a physio, what is needed is something every day, uh, cardiovascular. So that get, gets it into your lifestyle, whether it's cycling to work, walking to work, running. I know you can the guidelines say you can do the higher intensity three times a week instead of every day but i think try and get into doing something every day then weights twice a week is the is the golden one i think that's coming out of the evidence here that i would commit to and tap into some program that you can do twice a week whether it's something online that you do one of those brilliant things that came out during covid the youtube sign up for those um or do body pump class twice a week or something like that i would prioritize that and then get the rest into your lifestyle Thank you very much. Another question here. Any research about how menopause or HRT affects cerebral blood flow or volume? Um, I can't answer that specifically. What we do see from the athletes, it did protect cardiovascular systems, so their lipid profiles were better. Um, so, But I, I haven't seen enough of that. I think you need to maybe talk to an endocrinologist about that. Sure. Another question here, probably um, more for an endocrinologist. Uh, I'm not really sure myself. Uh, once you go on HRT, are you then stuck on it or how does it work? So I've read quite a lot about this. So my mum is 85 and she's on it and she says out oh, of her cold, dead hands, will they take it? And uh, she said, if it's good enough for Joan Collins, it's good enough for her. So her and Joan are on it. And she she's been taken off it every now and again for like, you know, an operational procedure. And she said she, she feels rubbish. So she goes back on it. So she's told her GP she knows where it is on the internet if they won't prescribe. So I think it's individual. You know, I think we don't have enough evidence of women being on it for longer. But at, at the moment, from what I can see, the guidelines from the WHO is it's not limited. There isn't there isn't clear guidelines that you need to be taken off it at a certain age. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Caroline Morgan's asking here: Is Pilates resistance training? Yeah, it is. If you do specifically if you are doing reformer pilates because you're pushing against springs um if you're doing some of the pilates you use bands you use a little ring thing and you're pushing against body weight so it's not the same as lifting big weights but there's aspects of it can be but i particularly like reformer pilates it's it's really good great thank you um elizabeth colton quinn asking here hi fiona fantastic talk great to highlight this part of life and the importance of exercise one additional thing that i'm sure you would agree if women have pelvic floor symptoms don't let this limit your exercise this is treatable too yeah so liz liz is our specialist in the physio department on um pelvic floor health in women and she's brilliant she's doing great research in that Absolutely, Liz, agree with you. She's a, pel she's a pelvic health specialist. So go and get it sorted out. See a specialist physiotherapist. Women suffer a lot in silence about this, particularly postpartum, and they never get it sorted out afterwards. I, I mean, I speak to other athletes about this. I, I refer patients. I refer sports colleagues to specialist pelvic health physios. So do get that sorted out. Don't let that be a limitation for you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, is there a resource anywhere with details of names of GPs who specialize in menopause? My GP laughed at me when I suggested that palpitations might be related to hormonal changes. Outrageous. Outrageous. So there are menopause hubs now in Dublin. I would even just Google that. There's, there's a couple of GP groups who set themselves up just running menopause clinics. So what I would suggest is you go to one of those and change GP. That I'm I'm disappointed, but I'm not surprised. I hear it all the time. Or I hear it, or, or they get a hormone test and they said, oh, you're not there yet, but they're very unreliable. Louise Newson, any of you who are on Instagram, um, N-E-W-S-O-N. -S so she has a great group of podcasts. She's a doctor in the UK who set up a big menopause hub and she does a lot of educational videos on that. So I'd highly recommend that. Um, her resources and, and she's she lots of chats about that she does different podcasts about different symptoms so she's a great resource um for anybody who wants to, any education louise houston is that her name newson n-e-w-s-o-n great yeah. thank you fiona thank you for the great talk when joint pain kicks in how to how to dose into the exercises and choose the more appropriate exercises is the question so what i would say for any 
Engaging any exercise program is graduated exposure, and that goes for everybody. So the biggest cause of a sports injury is on a custom load. So graduated exposure in, try and be guided by a physio or a good strength conditioning or good trainer and and, ex, and um, go up and up and up in the weights and they'll, they'll know how to dose for strength. So that's just get some advice in terms of getting your um, exercise regime that way. Okay, thank you. Um, accessing gyms, being assertive with doctors, finding time and space for resistance exercise, all depending on having confidence and economic resources. What can be done for or by women who don't have money, time or confidence? Are there any collaborative community initiatives that you know of? Yeah, so so for endurance exercise, I love Park Run. It's free. Go and plod it. Walk it. You know, there's always going to be people walking. They have a tail walker. I, I work a little bit with the Park Run Research Board. So that's a really good starting point. Um, I, I agree with you about resistance exercise is not widely available enough, but even if you could invest in one or two sessions with a trainer and get a program and, uh, you know, a lot of good exercise specialists want to help people. So they'll give you a program and off you go. And then there's some really good online resources as well, where you could do videos. Some of them are free as well. So maybe just get a little bit of help to get yourself started and think of it as an investment in your health um, and and then get something you can work away. And when you get a little bit educated, then you can work away at that. But things like part run are a really good starting point. Great. Thank you, Fiona. What are the areas, questions uh, would you most like to see research focus on in relation to exercise and menopause? Are there specific unanswered questions you're interested in? So, I mean, I think probably one of them is what is the optimal dosage of resistance exercise for women? Um, probably endurance exercise. What are the factors that influence recovery? So how, how do we, as physios, how do we dose people? Like, I don't even know as a, a competitive athlete how much I should be doing and how long I'll take to recover. But that's that's for men as well. So that will probably mean that it'll get more research will get done. And there are groups looking at that. I know there was a there's a big group in London looking at athletes and I think like I said that will filter down to the general population and I think the other one is HRT how does that influence our response to exercise and people's general well-being and are there alternatives to HRT for people who can't take HRT or don't, don't want to what are the optimal approaches thank you so much Fiona I know we're, we're coming to the end of our time but it's one last final question to take here if that's okay um is there a need or benefit in engaging men in these discussions naturally the majority all of the audience tends to be women um but we all live in, and work with uh, our friends with men um and sport, in, in, because of, of sport obviously um men play a key role um probably on you know on coaching and all, all those kind of roles in, in sport so is there a need do you think um to engage men in our in our discussions yeah, yeah, there is. And that's important. And actually, I tweeted today, specifically called out my male sports medicine colleagues who do help, who do work in this area. Um, so th we do need to engage men because often they're, they're still, you know, the patriarchy is still controlling some of the research money. I was on a meeting yesterday with um, England Rugby Player Welfare Group and their men that are driving that, they're, help, they're working with that. And obviously there's women involved as well. So there are great men out there and we need to engage them as our allies because um, that's going to help drive it on. So I agree with that. We don't want to work in silos. We, we, we've got the momentum, we've got the interest, but men need to get stuck in as well. And it, my experience is that they are, so that's good. Thank you so much, Professor Fiona Wilson. It's been a fantastic talk. And thank you also to the three faculties who put together this wonderful International Women's Day event. Um, we are very grateful to the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, Social Science, the Faculty of STEM and the Faculty of Health Science for, for putting this on for us. Thank you so much. Thanks.